uh, so welcome. You're you're at a class uh, called <clears throat> uh, Reconstruction: the the deep roots of early Christian theology. And again, my name is Mako Nagasawa. I'm the director of the Anastasis Center for Christian Education and Ministry. And uh, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of um, uh, an overview of of what we do as an organization and why this is one of the like the one of the favorite things that I have uh, to do. Um, so as an organization, we are interested in uh, decolonizing our faith and deconstructing uh, things that may need to be deconstructed because it was tainted by colonialism and materialism, power, and those kinds of things, racism and all of that. Um, we are also very concerned to, to ask, well, <clears throat> what did Christians believe before, especially in the early church? Because, uh, you know, we, we don't want to be saying things that no Christian has ever said before. And because if that were the case, then I'm not sure that would be good news, really. I, I'm not sure that that would be a stable thing to, to build our, our faith on. Christian witness on, our understanding of Jesus on. Um, and so we, we do deep dives into the early church. And this is um, probably, you know, something that is near and dear to my heart. I'm really grateful for you to journey on um, with, uh, with one another and with me in it. Because, you know, we, we don't want to just do deconstruction, I think. Uh, we want to reconstruct what we can and, and to really understand, you know, what is the, our understanding of scripture? What is our understanding of Jesus? What is our understanding of how has the Holy Spirit guided the church over time? Uh, and, and so this class was kind of born out of that. We're going to do 10 sessions. <clears throat> and uh, let me share my screen now. Uh, share screen. Um, optimize for video, I guess so. Okay. So this is, uh, you're at reconstruction. This is kind of the outline of the topics that we're going to, uh, talk about together. There are 10 <laughs> of these. Uh, so as you could see, we start off with Christian ethics, maybe because, you know, those are kind of the, uh, the, the most practical uh, the most applied. So we'll talk about slavery, women in the early church, children in the early church. And then for a few more sessions, we'll talk about the foundations of uh, Christian faith, the canonization of the New Testament. We'll specifically ask why, why not the Gospels of Thomas and Judas. Then we'll look at the Nicene Creed, the Trinity, and the limitations of human language. Uh, we, will, we will follow Athanasius of Alexandria into an understanding of the goodness of God and the healing of creation. We'll look especially at Jesus's atonement as a work of healing. And um, Athanasius is a, an amazing guide for that. We'll look at hell as the love of God and Christian mysticism and the shaping of desire. Basically, uh, what is the human being and the human person in Christian thought? And uh, we'll look at Gregory of Nyssa and the, the vision of ecstasy. He, he has a work called The Life of Moses, which is outstanding. And then we'll come back out into some um, uh, Christian ethics type of topics again. We'll look at Qumran, which is not, I mean, it's the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and things. Um, and we'll ask, what does this mean for Jewish Christian relations? And then Finally, we'll look at Romans 9 through 11 and the topics of predestination and free will, the hardening of hearts, and, and political theology, but the ongoing outreach to the Jewish community, and how that could have been uh, really an anchor point for uh, Christian theology to avoid anti-Semitism, especially in Europe. All right, so <clears throat> let's dive in here. Slavery, how the early church got it right. Let me just uh, offer a word of prayer here as we start. So Lord, it's a great privilege to be here with friends old and new. And we are grateful for the witness, the, the, the history, the tradition that we stand in. 
thank you that there are amazing things to be seen here, especially as we look at this topic. And this, in many ways, is, it is very gripping. It'll open new doors for us, I think. And, and I thank you for the chance for us to study together. Uh, be blessed, Jesus, and bless us as we go deep into your word and also how our, our forebearers, um, our, our forefathers and foremothers interpreted your teaching uh, to in a very surprising, refreshing, and revolutionary way. Inspire us here. In your name we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So how did the early church get it right? There's a, there's a lot of reasons to revisit this, um, this topic. Uh, I'll just name a few quickly. There, there is an, a rise in sex trafficking and forced prostitution, for instance. This is a very sad picture of um, Southeast Asian girls under the age of 12 who were um, liberated from a brothel. Child soldiers in different parts of the world. Um, Third is prison and criminal justice reform. This is a, a big issue in the United States where we are talking about mass incarceration and how do we de-incarcerate people? How do we help uh, folks reintegrate and return to citizenship? Um, debt and bonded labor. So forced labor trafficking <clears throat> is a huge issue in many parts of the world. So when we look at scripture, we have to ask, <clears throat> well, what does what does the Bible say really about slavery? If the Bible is ambiguous at best, then can we do better? I mean, that's a, that's a weird question to ask. Um, but after the Civil War in the United States, people felt like, well, we have done better than the Bible. So what would it mean if we have done better than the Bible? Number three, do I need to interpret the Bible metaphorically? That was one direction, especially after the Civil War that people took. And then how do we understand U.S. history? Both the awful, awful things as well as the accomplishments of U.S. history. I was, uh, I think, driving in Georgia when I saw this billboard and it is a picture of an enslaved African man and uh, juxtaposed with Colossians 3.22, slaves obey your masters. And it was um, brought to you by the American Atheist Association. And uh, it, it just raises this question again in a very pointed way. And uh, we do have to look at this and we, we have to look at early Christianity as well. So uh, let's do that. In First Clement, which is a document that was written by one of the leaders of the church at Rome in 90 AD. So this is one of the earliest documents that we have outside of the New Testament. This person is writing to the Corinthians on behalf of the church at Rome. And he says, we know many among ourselves who have given themselves up to bonds. In other, in other words, they sell themselves into some form of servitude, perhaps uh, Roman slavery, in order that they might ransom others. <clears throat> It's a broad category, but you could see, oh, they're doing this. They're aware that Christians have done this. Um, also around the same time, Polycarp of Smyrna, who's discipled by the either John the Apostle or John the Elder, um, if that's the same person or different, we don't know, uh, and Ignatius of Antioch. They, they are, he was like third in line after um, Simon Peter led the church at Antioch. They, they are you know, second generation Christian leaders, they free their slaves. So we know that uh, they did that. A guy named Ovidius was appointed Bishop of Braga in more modern day Portugal under Pope Clement in 95 AD. And during his run as uh, a church leader there, he emancipates 5,000 slaves, which is pretty amazing. That's a lot, that's a lot of people. Uh, between 98 and 117 AD, a Roman prefect named Hermas received baptism at an Easter festival with his wife. Uh, we know this because he, he writes a, something called the shepherd and we, that's preserved. Uh, he, he is baptized with his wife, children and 1,250 slaves. And on that occasion, he gave all his slaves their freedom and generous gifts besides. Okay, so he's an important Roman uh, official in the empire. 
And, and this is what he does all at once. This is really important because it highlights something. Uh, normally <clears throat> in pagan Rome, when uh, the master dies, his slaves would all be killed at the same time because they're kind of like uh, uh, roaming people without an authority, right? And so also they were property. And so when the master dies, like all the property would be buried with him. And so the slaves would, would be killed. Now the Christians take this tradition from Rome and, and they change it. They say baptism when we die and rise with Christ, that is a real death. Like I'm a new person now. The old me died, the new is born. I'm a new creation in Christ. And, and so all of the slaves then go free. We, we give slaves their freedom. And this didn't happen every time, but it happened on numerous occasions. And this is just one illustration of what Roman Christians are doing. Epitaphs in the Roman catacombs, they mention manumission of slaves. Not sure exactly what all the dates are. They're not always dated. Uh, in the late third century, Chromatius emancipates 1400 slaves after they're baptized with him. So there, another Roman noble person, very wealthy. Um, then we move to Christian leaders, Gregory of Nyssa, who was a bishop in the, the, Nyssa is in Asia Minor. In a sermon during Lent says this, God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. If he is in the likeness of God and rules the whole earth and has been granted authority over everything on earth from God, who is his buyer, tell me? Who is his seller? To God alone belongs his power, or rather not even to God himself. For his gracious gifts, it says, are irrevocable. God would not therefore reduce the human race to slavery, since he himself, when we had been enslaved to sin, spontaneously recalled us to freedom, that is in Christ. But if God <clears throat> does not enslave what is free, who is he that sets his own power above God's? Sorry, I'm moving this. And uh, <clears throat> we'll come back to this. Notice that he's, he's anchoring his argument in Genesis 1, okay? being made in God's image and also having authority over the earth. The, the issue it, with slavery is if you interfere with someone else's relationship with the land, like the ability to... to uh, benefit and enjoy it benefit from the work of their hands and enjoy the creation then you you're going against genesis one you see how that's a live question for them uh john chrysostom archbishop of constantinople Tinople, he's a heavy hitter teaches from ephesians in christ jesus there is no slave therefore it is not necessary to have a slave buy them and after you have taught them some skill by which they can maintain themselves set them free and then he says, slave marriages and families have rights to stay together. I asked you to consider uh, just different thought exercises uh, by reading some of these passages, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, um, and, and other Old Testament passages, which relationships take priority, right? Can a master uh, sell or break up a slave marriage or slave family? And here, John Chrysostom and others will say, no, they can't. There's a document called the Apostolic Constitutions written about 400 AD. And it's a summary of Christian teaching to that point. And it says, as for such sums of money as are collected from them in the aforesaid manner. In other words, you know how you take the offering plate and off, you know, like people put in some kind of offering, uh, designate them to be used for the redemption of the saints and the deliverance of slaves and captives. In other words, some of that money should go not just to like pay the church budget or like, you know, pay the salary of the priest and the bishop, but to be delivering slaves and captives. Oh my goodness, they did this regularly. And Augustine says the Christian community regularly used its funds to redeem as many kidnapped victims as possible and had recently purchased and, fr and freed 120 slaves whom the Galatians were boarding onto their ships. So, uh, a, represent a representative of North Africa, Roman North Africa, and, and the Christian community there. Acacius, Bishop of Amida in modern-day Eastern Turkey or Western Mesopotamia, 
in one act, he ransomed 7,000 Persian prisoners being held by the Romans. And Princeton church historian Samuel Hugh Moffat, in his uh, incredible two volumes, A History of Christianity in Asia, makes note of this and says, when the war between Byzantium and Persia, or the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, ended in 422, it may have been this generous gesture of Acacius that speeded the negotiations for peace and brought an end to persecution in Persia. The peace treaty contained the remarkable stipulation that freedom of religion was to be granted on both sides of the border for Zoroastrians in the Byzantine Empire and for Christians in Persia. So this guy had an incredible impact. How did he ransom 7,000 Persian prisoners that were being marched back to uh, Byzan Byzantium or Constantinople? He sold everything in his church, basically, and then went to the market and, and, um, and freed these people sent them back to Persia. Okay, so that's great. These are all acts of Christians, sometimes Christian leaders. And um, what now, what is the impact that Christians had on law and policy? So here we focus on the Roman Empire because we have the most data, not be necessarily because it is the most important, but just because we have the most data there. In 315 AD, Constantine, um, well, in 313, maybe he becomes a Christian. We don't really know. I'm not taking a position on that because uh, it's hard to say. But the, um, if we treat him generously, he does show that he's open to input from Christians. And in 315 AD and beyond, <clears throat> excuse me, he starts to change policies. So he imposed the death penalty on those who kidnap and enslave children. Where does he get that? Well, Exodus 21 is one place, Deuteronomy 24, verse 7, which I had you read. He forbade separating slave families. He made manumission possible at a church service. So it used to be uh, kind of tedious and a lot of paperwork you had to go before different magistrates. Emperor Constantine basically says, let's just make it as easy as going to a, a Roman, like a, a bishop in the church and saying, I set you free. And then boom, it's done. Why is this significant? Well, Constantine was at best a new Christian in 313. This indicates that the Christian community had a very strong anti-slavery position. Because the question is not whether Constantine himself is just like reading the Bible. The, the, the question is, how was Christian faith and, and representatives and leaders who now had the ear of the emperor starting to say, this is what law and policy should reflect. Uh, you know, another thing is branding on the face was absolutely forbidden. They used to do that, but there was a strong tradition that said that the face reflects the image of God, the human face. And so we don't want to um, mar the image of God. So we don't do that. <clears throat> In 595, a council at Rome. Uh, did someone want to ask uh, a question? Someone, want to ask a question? No, I'm someone mute themselves. Uh, okay. Sorry. All right. Back to these. Back to the slideshow. <clears throat> All right. A council at Rome under Gregory the Great permits a slave to become a monk without any consent from his master. What's that like? It's a lot like Paul's letter to Philemon, right? About Onesimus wanting to um, uh, <clears throat> run away. And, and <laughs> this kind of seems to say, you know, if ministry is, is what the, the runaway wants to do, then they don't even need consent from the master. That sounds a lot like Philemon. Um, in 649 AD, Clovis II, king of the Franks, frees and then marries his British slave, Batilde. Together, they dismantle slavery in France. Actually, it's a really powerful story. Someone should make a movie out of this. If any of you are into um, documentaries or, or making movies, amazing story, like a love story, social justice. It's incredible. In 1000 AD, Stephen I of Hungary establishes 
basically the I think the modern nation of Hungary. Um, Christina, you could you could confirm that uh, later and abolishes slavery. Says anyone setting foot in the uh, on the soil of Hungary will be free. And then in 1102, the London Church Council forbids slavery and the slave trade, which abolishes both throughout England. This decree emancipates 10% of England's population. This is going to come back to influence U.S. history uh, because in uh, 1772, there is the uh, Somerset case where an uh, African man who sails from Boston to London steps off a slave ship and wins his freedom in court. And the American colonies are just upset and terrified. It's like, what? What does this mean? <clears throat> in 1117, Iceland abolishes slavery in about 1300. The Netherlands do so. And by 1335, Sweden, which includes Finland, makes slavery illegal. Uh, the Scandinavian countries have by this time, by uh, maybe around I'm not sure, 1100, 1200, totally stopped the Viking raids. The, the church shut those down. And of course the Viking raids produced slaves. So you could see like Christian faith is, is making dramatic changes on this issue. So how did these Christians understand the Bible? First, uh, going back to Gregory of Nyssa's sermon called fourth homily on ecclesiastes they understand that israel's garden life represented adam and eve's garden life that israel was supposed to be a restoration in some way of what adam and eve and all humanity were supposed to enjoy if the fall had never happened we'd still be in a garden land so israel is a restoration of that partially and so when king solomon says in ecclesiastes i acquired slaves and slave girls Gregory says, what? What is that you say? You condemn a person to slavery whose nature is free and independent. And in doing so, you lay down a law in opposition to God, overturning the natural law established by him. What natural law? Genesis 1. For you subject to the yoke of slavery one who was created precisely to be a master of the earth and who was ordained to rule by the creator as if you were deliberately attacking and fighting against the divine command. Take note of that, the way he's arguing. He's saying kidnapping or slave market purchases are totally against the divine command. They are against Genesis 1. Basil of Caesarea uh, says marriage between slaves is just as valid as marriage between free people. The idea is slaves are just as human. You cannot interfere with what? Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, so you get the sense like they are reading Genesis 1 and 2 as this is still valid. There's a tendency, right, for Protestants to kind of think, well, <clears throat> functionally, uh, we begin with Genesis 3, like the fall. But they are reasoning out Christian ethics from Genesis 1 and 2. They are also uh, saying that the human body is made for Jesus by his spirit. Where do we get that insight? 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. And so Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. The idea is Jesus is the leading partner in your with your body, uh, it, and and then he applies that principle to slavery, marriage, and circumcision in chapter seven. And with regards to slavery, he says this: Were you called while you were a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he was called while free as Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Notice how he is quoting himself. <clears throat> you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. That same principle from 1 Corinthians 6 ties over. Therefore, glorify God in your body also means do not become slaves of men. There's a orientation towards freedom and against slavery. Although slavery is a complex institution. so. 
we'll, we'll get back to that. John Chrysostom says, Joseph, though a slave, did not yield to being a sex slave, right, with Potiphar's wife. In fact, there are limits set to slaves by God himself. And up to what point one ought to keep them has also been determined, and to, and to transgress them is wrong. Namely, when your master commands nothing which is unpleasing to God, it is right to follow and to obey, but no farther. <laughs> That's amazing. For thus the slave becomes free. But if you go further, even though you are free, you have become a slave. At least he intimates this, saying, be not ye the servants of men. <clears throat> and then let's talk about briefly prostitution, because this is, uh, this is a huge issue back then. Uh, prostitutes were supposed to register with the authorities. A state tax on those registered prostitutes was introduced in the first century AD. That's just the Roman Empire. A, Rome, uh, a woman who had once registered as a prostitute retained that stigma for the rest of her life, even if she ceased all professional activity. Although the church fathers fulminated against the commerce of the body with the same ferocity as against other sins of the flesh rampant in the Roman world, prostitution being a social phenomenon rather than a personal sin, such as fornication, did not, strictly speaking, lie within the spiritual jurisdiction of the church. Despite its condemnation of all premarital and extramarital sexual activity, the church recognized prostitution to be an inevitable feature of worldly society, which it had no hope or ambition to reform. St. Augustine even warned that the abolition of prostitution, were it possible, would have, would have disastrous consequences for society. The practice, he believed, was a necessary evil in an inevitably imperfect world. Canonical wrath or church judgment was focused rather on those who profited from this commerce. For while prostitution was regarded as a social phenomenon distinct from the sin of fornication, procuring was considered by the church to be synonymous with the sinful act of encouraging debauch, since the latter is usually associated with a pecuniary motive, whereas fornication can be committed out of passion as well as out of desire for money. Proc procuring was therefore considered to be a matter of of spiritual jurisdiction, and strong measures were taken against it at the Council of, of Elvira in the early 300s, whose canons were included in most of the major canon law collections of the Middle Ages, I'll explain. What this is saying is the church leaders said, we can understand if women are prostitutes, and there are many reasons for why they might be prostitutes, none of which reflect her personal choice. Maybe she was blackmailed, maybe she was impoverished, maybe she was uh, left and abandoned by her parents and then picked up by a pimp. There's all kinds of reasons why a woman might be a prostitute. There's only one reason why a man buys sex from a prostitute, and that is always sinful. That is always his responsibility. So we're gonna prosecute the buyer <laughs> or the and the pimp um or we'll go after them that's sinful and so that is how the church handled prostitution fascinating right it is the same thing as the what's called the scandinavian progressive model which has been shown as the only way to reduce human trafficking human sex trafficking basically you criminalize the buyer uh you do not criminalize the prostitute because you want women to turn themselves into the authorities and not have to go to jail. Like they, they will do it if they feel uh, safe and if, if, um, <clears throat> if they feel threatened on the streets. All right, so I'm gonna uh, let you break, I'm gonna break you up into uh, the breakout rooms and I'd like you to think about these two questions what, and, and talk about them. What do you think about how the early Christians read Genesis 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, okay? So there's a scriptural question. And secondly, did you know this history? If yes, how? And if no, why do you think that is? Did you know this history? If yes, how? If no, why do you think that is? Why didn't you know this? Uh, there are two major issues here. <clears throat> Scripture, were the early Christians right? How would we know that? How would we argue that? And how do we interpret U.S. history as part of church history? I, I, I think this could also apply in other countries as well, but uh, I am less of an expert or le I, I know um, South African history or uh, English and Scottish history uh, less well. Um, 
because I'm an American. So forgive me for you know my ignorance there, uh, but please you know talk to me afterwards about it. So we'll look at um, in case you have to go. Uh, th this will also be on the notes and in the in the link because it's a uh, the 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 PowerPoint presentation is saved as part of Zoom. Um, but the, there's some stuff here on my website, this particular page, and also US hist on, on slavery and US history. All right. So one basic question when it comes to the Old Testament and uh, is the Hebrew word <clears throat> ebed or ebedim, the singular and plural forms of servanthood or slavery. And, and it's a difficult word to translate. The Greek word used in translation in the Septuagint version is called is doulos or duli or dule, uh, depending on whether you're talking about male or female or both. The English translations take that word and translate it slave sometimes, RSV and RSV, or servant at other times, King James, Amplified, and so on, or maybe something else. Uh, the, the important thing here is is not whether there's like a singular possible meaning for these word for this word, but what is the overall context? And here is a good thought exercise put to us by N.T. Wright. He has this phrase, I'm mad about my flat. What does that mean? What does it mean? I mean, we're all English speakers here. The issue is you don't know because if you're in the US, it means I'm angry about my flat tire. But if you're in the UK, it means I'm happy about my apartment. I'm mad about my flat. You don't, it's weird, right? Because you know the words, but you don't actually know what the whole sentence means unless you know the context. And so that tells us that there is a, such a thing as that guards us or push, should put a caution on us for committing the word thing fallacy. As if like, you know the word that it points to the same thing. It may not. So what does this mean in scripture? <clears throat> the early Christians were very good at understanding how words are influenced by context and translations. And so when we get to the Nicene Creed, we'll see that. Uh, what we call slavery or indentured service reflects the fact that ancient Israel's primary, primary political and economic institution was the household. They did not have apartments or homeless shelters to house people banks to lend to people, corporations to employ them, police to enforce the laws, prisons to incarcerate, or halfway houses to rehabilitate people. Households on farmlands serve all of those functions. That's really important. So when you have the diaspora Jewish community away from the garden land, you also see that they are not practicing this ebedim form of servanthood. They do not have slaves to wait upon them as they consider that the ownership of servants is entirely against nature. Against nature, like against Genesis 1 and 2. For nature has borne all men to be free, but the wrongful and covetous acts of some who pursued that source of evil, inequality, have imposed their yoke and invested the stronger with power over the weaker. So the Jewish community in Alexandria, Egypt, did not practice slavery. This is a good sign that this is the right way to read the Old Testament, okay? It's not just a clever way to read it, but it's the right way. Here, again, Jews in the Dead Sea region, they are not in the garden land. Uh, it's, we'll get to them, like what exactly they believe, why were they hiding out there or camping out there? The Essenes rejected slavery in principle as incompatible with the equality of all men before their creator. Wow, again, Genesis 1. Uh, Henry Chadwick is probably drawing on Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who said this, this is demonstrated by that institution of theirs, which will not suffer anything to hinder them from having all things in common, so that a rich man enjoys no more of his own wealth than he who hath nothing at all. In other words, ownership and consumption are two different things. Wow. There are about 4,000 men that live in this way and neither marry wives nor are desirous to keep servants as thinking the latter tempts men to be unjust. <laughs> oh, man. So again, uh, the, the Essene Jewish community in the Dead Sea, no slavery. Why? Well, it's a little more textured, but 
because of Genesis one and uh, because we're not in the garden land. So that matters and we'll see why that matters. Uh, a few years ago, I did this really exhaustive um, study of biblical slavery in the Bible. And it, it also carried me into just slavery in other parts of the world, especially the ancient world. <clears throat> and I found that you really have to look at what is the reason why, what is the source of enslavement? What is the source of slaves? There's a lot of different sources of, or reasons why people fell into slavery, war, captivity kidnapping or piracy, purchase from a slave trade, perpetual involuntary servitude, as if you, were, you, if you were born to slave parents, if you were sold by your parents, uh, indentured servitude because of misfortune. Like you, you say, I'm having a famine in my part of the world, and so I'm going to become a servant somewhere else. Indentured servitude because of debt, right? Like I, I owe you and I can't pay it back, and so I'll, I'll work for you penal servitude, where a community says, this is going to be the consequence for you stealing from someone or from the community. You go work for the town or, or for someone. Uh, voluntary servitude, for whatever reason, and political vassalage. All of those things are called, or people use the word slavery for it. And so in the ancient world, notice it's common, all the way down, right in the second column. In the Old Testament, you have Hebrews and non-Hebrews, and in every single case, it's very limited, or it doesn't exist. Uh, oops, hold on just a second. Please watch your uh, mute buttons. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you some examples. There is no stealing or coveting. So in Exodus 22, if you steal property like a sheep, then I, if I steal a sheep from you, I have to give back not just that sheep but two to five times the original amount of what I stole, two to five sheep worth, because I have to rebuild trust. Now, in Exodus 21, he who kidnaps or steals a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Whoa, that's serious stuff. Why? Because Exodus 21 and 22 and thereabouts, what God is doing is he's, he is... Uh, helping Israel to not be like what they learned under Pharaoh in Egypt, right? So everything that they experienced before, God is undoing, or he's qualifying, or he's limiting, and, and this is one of the things. So there is absolutely no kidnapping someone into slavery, and the graphic there is from 12 years a slave, where uh, this, this guy is being kidnapped. That shouldn't have happened. Um, Theodore Dwight Weld is writing this and wrote this in 1837, right? He's a prominent Christian abolitionist. And he says, slavery is the highest possible violation of the eighth commandment. To take from a man his earnings is theft. To take the earner, oops, is compound superlative perpetual theft. It is to be a thief by profession. It is a trade, a life of robbery that vaults through all the gradations of the climax at a leap, the dread, terrific, giant robbery that towers among other robberies, a solitary horror, monarch of the realm. In other words, you can't steal more than this. <laughs> to steal a person into slavery, that is horrific. And it, that's, that's how he was reading scripture. Uh, there is no slave trade, for they are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt, they are not to be sold in a slave trade. In other words, if I owe you something, then I, you can't sell my debt to someone else. That would be selling a slave into, uh, to another person. So my debt to you is personal. I have to pay it off to you or, or my, a family member of mine needs to help or you could forgive it, or a jubilee rolls around, or something like that. But essentially, you cannot commodify debt. When we, I'll come back to mortgage debt, credit card debt, student loan debt, and medical debt later. But this is a huge issue. You can't commodify debt. Uh, there's no perpetual servitude uh, because every jubilee, every jubilee year, which is every 50 years, people go free. 
or they go free in the seventh year of service, whichever happens first. So Deuteronomy 15 and Leviticus 25 uh, talk about that. In Exodus 21, verses 7 through 11, there, this refers to a preliminary form of wedding betrothal for young girls. It reads funny. It's hard to understand. But this is not a sale by parents of a girl into slavery. Uh, the daughter is being sold into betrothal and became a free woman within the new family. She was not a servant with servant duties and not a chattel slave that could be resold. How do we know? Because any breach of marriage contract by the betrothed man or family earns the girl her freedom and the would-be husband receives no compensation. Uh, this appears to be a commentary about how Laban treated Leah and Rachel, right? They, but maybe a, with, a, with some variation there. Uh, and this was not required, it was just regulated to protect the girl, but Jewish commentators say, yeah, th this is kind of an option for an impoverished family to give the daughter a better life <clears throat> in some cases. So, but, the, but she had rights and she was not a slave. So, okay, uh, there was very limited self indenture, like loaning money with it, interest was strictly forbidden, which protected the poor from exploitation. Three times in the Torah, it is said, do not lend money at interest. And it was uh, mandatory upon being asked, like if there is a poor man with you, you shall freely open your hand to him and he, and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he asks, whatever he lacks. So debts were canceled every seven years. Interest, and this uh, is really important because interest-laden loans were the chief cause of people being sold into slavery in many places in the ancient Near East. It contributed significantly to slavery in classical Greek and Roman society. In other words, you could see because of the anti-usury laws that God was really concerned to prevent people from falling into slavery. How about uh, penal servitude? Well, that is limited. It did happen. Uh, so a thief who couldn't repay a, a theft could become a slave for a time, right? I just mentioned that. There were no prison systems in Old Testament Israel. And, you know, notice that, I'm not saying that this was the best way to go, but the 13th Amendment permitted penal servitude. And technically, we use it. So the, uh, the idea being <clears throat> there's a community role um, involved at certain times for servitude like this, for the abed servitude. Uh, sometimes there's voluntary servitude, but that was limited. So uh, in Exodus 21, if the slave says, you know, I want to stay, then the master has to accept them. That there, there could be reasons for that. Maybe um, the, the master was more prosperous. Maybe there was poverty back at home. We don't know. The Jewish Encyclopedia Online says that uh, the voluntary slave went free in the Jubilee year or upon the death of a master. So what th that conditions what the word permanently meant. All right. Uh, there were standard terms of exit, right? So after six years of service, Anyone in abed servitude went free, or the jubilee year, whichever happened first. Or if you were redeemed by your family members or by yourself. Okay, let me read Leviticus 25, 48 and 49. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or one of his blood relatives from his family may redeem him, or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. In other words, the Ebed servant in Jewish law could accumulate his or her own wealth. That is different than most slave codes, because if you're owned by your master, you can't own anything for yourself in principle. But that is not true in Jewish law. That shows us again that in English, the word slave is probably not the best way to translate the word abed. Uh, all right, or bodily harm, right? If you, if you are a slave and you get your tooth or eye injured, <laughs> and here's that, this funny 
uh, meme here. I don't always punch people in the face, but when I do, they thank me for it. Or when restitution is paid in the case of penal servitude, in other words, like if I repay my debt, then I go free. Or escape. Escape? Really? Yeah. In Deuteronomy 23, you shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. How far does he have to go? <laughs> right down the street? Next door? I don't, it doesn't say. But you're supposed to help him. And uh, Raymond Westbrook says, a slave could also be freed by running away. This provision is strikingly different from the laws of slavery in the surrounding nations and is explained as due to Israel's own history of slavery. It would have the effect of turning slavery into a voluntary institution. Wow. Uh, and note, there, there was no police force in Old Testament Israel, so running away was easy. Easy. So the reason why you would be indentured is because you wanted to be restored to the community in full. <clears throat> uh, that's why it was voluntary. Uh, but if you were abused, you had the right to run away and for other people to help you. Uh, the Ebedim under the law of Moses held all these rights. You had a right to Sabbath rest, feasts, holy days, which was a rest from labor. You know, the situation was such that there were no plantations or mines in Israel, only farmland to sustain the household. You worked and lived at the same level as everybody else. You had a right to your body. There was no sex slavery, absolutely none. God's vision for marriage was retained in all cases. It was a contract of labor. You had kinship rights, marriage rights, and you had personal legal rights relating to physical protection and payments, protection from breach of contract, right to testify in trials, freedom of movement, freedom to own weapons. Abraham and, and Sarah had ser owned servants or ebedim, and they were armed to the teeth. Abraham sent 318 of them to battle for Lot, Lot's freedom in Genesis 14. <clears throat> So they could accumulate savings, wealth, and property of their own versus other slave systems where personal wealth was not permitted. All right, so remember what we call slavery or indentured service in English reflects the fact that ancient Israel's primary political and economic institution was the household. They did not have apartments, banks, corporations, police, prisons, or halfway houses. Households on farmlands served all those functions. And so anyone who contracted their labor or worked on a household or had the community tell them you had to work on this household yes that was ebedim service uh should that should we think of the transatlantic slave trade in english no that's not what it was uh slavery of non-hebrews very similar um you can use them as permanent ebedim meaning the contracts of service can extend beyond the jubilee. That's the context here. In Hebrew, the word buy or bought with money or possess takes its meaning from the subject to which it is applied. So don't be afraid of reading some translations or if you know Hebrew, finding that, yeah, these words are used uh, like you bought someone's service or possess servants, right? In the 10th commandment. Um, because look at how else how those words are used. Eve bought or begot a man from the Lord, but without money, of course. God bought Israel without paying. In other words, God gained or wrestled free Israel from Egypt. A person who hears reproof buys or gets wisdom without money. A relative could buy or redeem a kinsman from slavery into freedom without owning that kinsman afterward. And in English, we speak of buying politicians, friendship, or a person's loyalty without referring to chattel slavery per se. So just because, yes, at times in Hebrew, it's, it sounds like <clears throat> uh, at, at times you bought a person, uh, or it really means bought the services of a person or bought their loyalty or something like that. So to be called a slave of someone else or to have your services and abilities not your body or your personhood, bought by someone was often very positive language to use because it was a relational time. I if Even if I'm like a, a king of one realm, I would say I'm the slave of 
the king of another. Like I'm the servant of that king, a greater king, because there's an alliance there. That's political vassalage. So th that does not mean chattel slavery. So recall that you have to know the context. I'm mad about my flat. What, does the, what do those words mean? Well, it depends on the context. So what does ebed or ebedim or dulos or uh, servanthood mean? It depends on the context. So when we get to the New Testament, the church was a, there are some differences. The church was a voluntary community that inherited the institution of slavery from outside itself, not from Judaism, but from the Greco-Roman society. And so in Greek culture, you had this elitism. Athens was, well, and Sparta as well, they were the first civilization to use mass slavery. Plato said barbarian slaves were vital in the Republic for all the, they should do all the work, we should do all the thinking. <laughs> Aristotle said from the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection and others are for rule. So that's how he explained, why do we get to rule? Well, we're born better. And Plato and Aristotle owned five and 14 slaves as enumerated in their wills. So we do know this about them. Roman slavery uh, was also very broad. There were many reasons why people were enslaved, war, birth, debt, but also career advancement, often voluntarily entered into. Manumission was relatively frequent, but harboring a slave a fugitive was punishable by death. So that was Roman law, which shapes Paul's response in Philemon. <clears throat> now in the New Testament, you have, I, I ran this against the same categories and I, I come out with this and I double check against the early church. How, how did they understand it? War captivity. No, they did not uh, view it as legitimate. Kidnapping piracy, absolutely not. Slave trade, no. Perpetual involuntary servitude, like as if you were born to slave parents. No, they did not view it as legitimate. Uh, could you be sold by your parents? No. Now, there were limited uh, tolerated forms of indentured servitude or slavery or whatever you want to call it, uh, but we have to pay attention to the context. Misfortune, indebtedness, penal servitude, and voluntary servitude. Christians did accept slave, quote unquote, slavery on those terms. Here's how we can see it. Uh, Jesus offers a new humanity, a new creation, so slavery was not intended from creation. There is no warfare, violence, or land acquisition in, in Christian ethics, so there are no war captives. In fact, Jesus says you have to give up land inheritance and all wealth in principle for the benefit of other people, and that includes slaves, so there's no kidnapping, there's no slave trading or forced enslavement. This is where the New Testament is the most explicit. First Timothy 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 4.6, and Revelation 18.13. Revelation talks about slaves, not positively. And then Jesus wants to bless all humanity. So there's no racial slavery or categorical slavery based on intelligence or something else. And marriage and sexuality take priority over any other relationship. So there should be absolutely no sex slavery or sex trafficking. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians 6, you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. We looked at 1 Corinthians 7, you're bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. That parallelism is really important. It tells us the human body is meant for Jesus's lordship by his spirit. And so how can we tell? Because of the parallel phrasing. And so the church is this voluntary countercultural community. It's distinct from both society and the state. And there was voluntary leaving uh, the Christian faith. I mean, people could leave the faith, but what that means is that Christian ethics were for Christians. They were not for non-Christians and evangelism was the primary way of influence. Christians did start to apply sub-Christian ethics to non-Christians like Constantine's laws that limited slavery because it was about harm reduction. And then, you know, Christians didn't have proscribed punishments for crimes and sins because the church is not a state. So do we know what to do in every single case? No, 
I mean, we, we have to think that through. We have to understand the culture and the times. That in that sense, so penal servitude, yeah, that that's part of the reason why the New Testament, the apostles did not just say, let's go abolish all forms of slavery as they experienced it. If they had said that, they would also be saying, let's do away with all civic punishments and let's do away with all ways of resolving debt. Would they have said that? No, that's not a responsible thing to say. So <clears throat> instead, they subvert it, right? So the, the Christian household is a platform for Christian mission. So households need to be part of Christian mission. They provide space, hospitality, care for the sick and the poor. Slaves and masters have the same Christian responsibilities for love, mission, leadership, and gifting, not just locally, but globally. And I had you think about certain questions, like what if the spirit gives the gifting of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to someone who is currently a slave? What's the church supposed to do? Well, remember what John Chrysostom said about that. The master can't interfere with Jesus's commands. Oh, so, so the master then becomes a sponsor of Christian mission. And then there's other questions. Can a master separate a husband and wife who are slaves? No. Can a widowed woman own or manage male slaves uh, duly? Uh, the, the point there being, it can, she can, and it's not gendered, right? So in 1 Timothy um, chapter 5, we have widows who have, household servants. Uh, there, I say that because there are some complementarian uh, churches and Christians who say uh, the principle of gender he, he, you know, needs to be, um, gender hierarchy needs to be applied in every relationship. Well, then somehow Paul missed that memo. Coercion in Ephesians 6.4 is clearly seen as evil. And slaves had recourse to confront masters who sin, obstruct Christian mission, or ask for something immoral. That's the Matthew 18 principle. And so in the end, power is subverted and masters would have to become sponsors of Christian mission. So there were forms of uh, slavery that still seemed meaningful, like repaying debts, uh, that was meaningful. Social climbing is not considered an appropriate motivation. That's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 7. Christian leadership also puts a limiter on slavery. Ministry is valued highly, and it led to early manumission, like in Philemon and other places, and it led to an early Christian meritocracy. In other words, your character and your skill trumps your, your uh, slave status. So what's key to understanding slave and master relations is the sequencing of responsibilities and ideas and texts. It also really helps if you read 1 Corinthians before you read Ephesians. We we're talking about this in our group. And uh, because that's because 1 Corinthians is more clear. Jesus is Lord, and therefore he limits the commitments that you can make to other people because he's Lord. He's Lord of you. Right, and the way he wants to use you and your body as the leading partner in his mission is that you have to be careful about other commitments you make, including Christian marriage, right? And he says in 1 Corinthians 7, I wish that all were as me, like we we're all afraid of that at some point in our lives, like that's, that singleness is kind of challenging, but also towards married couples, he says, um, those who are married should be as those who were not. And he's not saying that you're free to have an affair. He's saying, don't be a narcissistic couple. Live your life still outwardly for the church, for the mission, and then for your marriage. If you didn't have 1 Corinthians and you only had Ephesians and Colossians, it would be harder to see that. It's possible still, but 1 Corinthians is clearer. And, and so I think that you, we need to read 1 Corinthians before we read Ephesians and Colossians, not least because Paul wrote 1 Corinthians before Ephesians and Colossians, and he wrote 1 Corinthians 
from Ephesus. So the Ephesians knew 1 Corinthians. All right, so it's key to sequence responsibilities, ideas, and texts. Jesus is Lord, and so anyone else who claims authority over you and your body, that you have to limit that. And so amongst themselves, Christians basically ignored the legal and social stigma of slavery. Do, 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 do. Okay, did the early Christians see this? Yes, here's an example. Basil of Caesarea, he's commenting. So, so Christians inherit a complex institution by responding in two ways. One is manumitting slaves and supporting them in the community. And the other is simply ignoring it, ignoring slavery. So uh, how do we see this? They condemned many sources of, ensla of enslavement. So you can see them thinking through, well, how did people become enslaved? We have to go to root causes. This is Basil of Caesarea when he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Among men, no one is a slave by nature. What is by nature? Genesis 1. For men are either brought under a yoke of slavery by conquest, like war prisoners, like our Guantanamo Bay uh, in America, or they are enslaved on account of poverty, as the Egyptians were oppressed by Pharaoh, or by a wise and mysterious dispensation. The worst children are by their father's order condemned to serve the wiser and the better. <laughs> so parental authority. In this world, then, it is thus that men are made slaves. But they who have escaped poverty or war or do not require the tutelage of others are free. That's Basil of Caesarea, a really important guy. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit in this book. He's not discussing a full Christian ethical treatment of slavery's root causes. He's just explaining why the Holy Spirit is not a slave or servant of God on the level of the angels. And he goes out of his way to qualify and critique the human institution of slavery. In other words, this isn't his real topic at all, but he still feels compelled to like critique it. This is Gregory of Nyssa, who is actually the younger brother of Basil of Caesarea. Uh, and again, I'm gonna, we're com I already read this, but this is his commentary. This is his sermon on Ecclesiastes 2.7 which is voiced by King Solomon, right? So does he believe this is inspired? Absolutely, but he believes that King Solomon is sinning here. Solomon says, I acquired slaves and slave girls. What is that you say? And then he goes on, you're, you're breaking Genesis one. Like humanity is made in the image of God and you're supposed to let every human being enjoy the creation as a ruler. In other words, Genesis 1 has to be true for every single person, not just Adam and Eve, everyone. And so he says here, who is his buyer? Tell me if he, you know, who is his seller? To God alone belongs this power, or rather not even to God himself. For his gracious gifts, it says, we are, are irrevocable. God would not therefore reduce the human being to slavery since he himself when he, we had been enslaved to sin, spontaneously recalled us to freedom. But if God does not enslave what is free, who is he that sets his own power above God's? Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Clement of Rome, first century, again, uh, say, uh, basically observes that, yeah, I mean, there are some among us, because they're so enthusiastic about freeing others, they surrender themselves to slavery. So, it's, this is not a condemnation of all slavery. And in fact, I don't know how he reconciles that with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, don't do this. <laughs> He's just saying he can discern many different reasons for why people um, are in servitude or in slavery. And so there are two ways that Christians responded, freeing the slaves and supporting them or ignoring the slavery within the Christian community. If they do the former, then they, they are condemning different sources of enslavement. They have an ethics of generosity, inclusion, hospitality, and forgiveness, uh, which is important if people have debt or crime in their background. Uh, they integrate newly freed people, and they have a strong leaning towards voluntary manumission, as shown by uh, what the Roman Christians did in baptisms. So they sometimes do that, or they just ignore it. 
They embrace the full humanity of the person with all rights from and responsibilities to Jesus, like don't break up slave families. So uh, Christians did not enslave anyone for three to four centuries. When you get to Augustine, he, you know that this is important because he's the first to argue for a just war theory. He's trying to define and limit the defense of war. And you could interpret this as both a good faith effort, but also a rationalization. That impacts slavery because people become slaves uh, partly through war captivity. And then when Islam starts and the Christians and Muslims are at war with one another uh, in Spain and Portugal, Eastern Europe and the Middle East, you do have uh, slavery as a result of war captivity, although the Christians are trying to mitigate it in different ways. But elsewhere, Christian faith dismantled slavery in France, Hungary, England, Iceland, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and many Mediterranean city states. That's really impressive. These are the only places in the world where slavery was abolished. So is there a moral foundation in scripture? The early church would say, certainly. It comes from Genesis 1 and 2 because of who we are as made in God's image, meant to rule and meant to have family relations that take priority over any other relations. And then Genesis three and four and 11 describe the origins of empire, which violate God's vision. So the Bible leaves open the possibility of applying sub-Christian ethics in public policy and intervention. Uh, I'm going to briefly go into the transatlantic slave trade and what this means, at least for the United States. Why did Christians get involved in slavery? To compete with the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottoman Empire sacked Constantinople, that meant that Christians in Western Europe had to go to, uh, uh, to India for spices um, around Africa basically because their food was bland and Indian spices are awesome. So they, they sail around Africa and they discover that Arab Muslims had created a network of slave trading posts and ways to manipulate uh, African tribes against each other to acquire slaves. Uh, and eventually they wanted to grow sugar, which is a semi-addictive substance also brought from Asia to then the Mediterranean, then to the Caribbean. Okay, so that's the beginning of this. <clears throat> the argumentation in Great Britain is there are abolitionists and there are pro-slavery camps, but it is not the same as the United States. Evangelical Christians are abolitionists. They demonstrate clarity about the Bible and they say the Bible's against this kind of slavery. There were some pro-slavery arguments, but they're basically Anglican old money men who argued from economics, like, well, we're making a lot of money or this is good for our country. It's not, they didn't make a biblical argument. Why? Because they knew. It, we settled this in 1102, right? The English law set people free. And anyone setting foot on the soil of England would be set free who was enslaved. And that was why James Somerset, the African man uh, in 1772 successfully sued for his freedom. And that's why the American colonies went berserk when that happened. They could tell, uh-oh, the British empire is gonna abolish slavery. They're really committed to this. Now, because the, the law, English law said, set foot on the soil of England, uh, then that's what allows the colonies to be in this legal gray zone. So the British empire uh, starts, the, the moral conscience starts to catch up with, uh, you know, with what they're doing. And, and so in, I think 1809, they abolished the slave trade. And then in 1833, Great Britain commits economic suicide by emancipating all slaves, all slaves throughout the British empire. And it's peaceful. They don't fight a civil war to do it. In, and in fact, they feel so strongly about this that the British Navy blockades slave ports in the Middle East and Africa. And so this begins uh, 
this is complicated, but this is how Christians shut down Muslim slavery. Okay, and I'll, I'll come back to that because it's still relevant. How did Christians justify slavery in the US? By reinterpreting or blunting Genesis 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. So first they said non-white people are not human. So that was around the time of Christopher Columbus. This is good timing for us to remember that because we're next week we'll, we'll be coming up on that weekend. Non-white people are not human? Okay, so I guess Genesis 1 doesn't apply to them. Or, okay, they're human, but they're under the curse of Ham or, or the mark of Cain or something like that. So they're being punished by God. This is why we can enslave them, keep punishing them. Non-white people are less civilized. They're not fit for democracy. They're not rational enough. They're sub-Christian, like even when they come to Christ, they don't fully qualify as Christians. Like we're not gonna set them free at baptism, for example. And only some white people can have the land, like men can have land, or you know, as opposed to women, or you know, like not the Irish, that kind of thing. So all kinds of ways that Christians are trying to get around what the early church taught and what Christian tradition said. <clears throat> Uh, the excuse, and we talked about this, is that slavery was evil, but the American founding fathers were men of their time. We said, no, they're not. They were conscious of being heretics. Capitalism sought cheap land and labor, and powerful white men wanted to practice heresy by reinterpreting church history and redefining biblical words. Okay, it's really important that slavery was abolished on English soil in 1102, and the Somerset case happened in London in 1770. Uh, how did Christians justify slavery in the U.S.? By saying words mean what I say they mean, which is fascist or is proto-fascist. And there is a reliance on something called the Scottish School of Common Sense. You could look this up on Wikipedia. The presumption that understanding things should be simple. And so when we say slavery here is slavery in the Bible, well, that should be obvious. It is not obvious. And so here's some questions for us to ponder. The challenge, there is a challenge to conservatives here. Now, today, the Christian right often charges the left or the secular left with changing the meaning of words like resurrection or love or marriage. Like these words don't mean what you say they mean, <clears throat> or you're generalizing them. Uh, some liberal Protestant denominations say Jesus was resurrected not bodily, but as a psychological event in the minds of the disciples, so we can have that kind of resurrection and so on. And so the Christian right is worried about this, but here's the thing, you started it, right? The, the Christian right began this pattern with slavery and changed a bunch of words and their meanings in order to fit. So salvation becomes salvation of the soul, but not the body. Righteousness becomes legal standing with God maybe it means piety, but it doesn't mean justice, even though that's the same word in Greek, dikaiosini, like suddenly it just means legal standing without your actual behavior. Justice is retributive and not restorative. And then there's a whole bunch of phrases and, and biblical words and things that then people misinterpret as if six days means six 24 hour periods. That's impossible as if Israel, like biblical Israel, means the state of Israel today at the expense of pal the Palestinians who are Christians or who are beloved neighbors. That, that really cannot be true. Or as if the phrase in the clouds, in the clouds means rapture and not Daniel's enthronement motifs, right? Like that in Daniel seven, in the clouds means you're enthroned. It doesn't mean that you're that suddenly the Christians are going to disappear. So there's a, those are real challenges to the conservative Christian right in the United States, at least. But there's also a challenge to liberals. After the Civil War, many uh, progressive Christians who were abolitionists started to snub their noses at the Bible as if we have done better than the Bible since the Civil War. Like, even Jesus and Paul didn't abolish slavery, but we abolished slavery. But they were wrong. The liberal progressive Protestants were wrong about doing better than Jesus and Paul. 
they began because how they were defining slavery was not the same as how the Bible defined it. They began to interpret scripture moralistically and non-miraculously, like Jesus' resurrection is psychological, not physical. And when you look at all the other ways in the Bible that, that uh, servanthood is something that the Bible is concerned about, limits or says like, that, hey, there's, uh, we want to limit how people get into it or there are ways to exit it, they didn't pay attention much either. Social gospel liberal Protestants did not address the failure of reconstruction or white supremacy in the New Deal and US imperialism rarely. And furthermore, liberals share the blame with conservatives for building the prison state. What do I mean here? Well, look at wage theft in scripture. God condemns it, Isaiah 58, James five. But wage theft in the US isn't even a crime. Stolen wages, the amount of it is greater than all other forms of robbery. Burglaries, robberies, shoplifting, and auto theft. Put all that together, and it's still less than stolen wages, and yet wage theft is not a crime. The Economic Policy Institute says 2.4 million workers lose $8 billion annually in the 10 most populous states alone. So that's a real concern. Really? I, have we done better than the Bible on this? I don't think so. Wage stagnation and declining purchasing power, like in the minimum wage debate, is another angle on this and job losses another angle meanwhile we have billionaires and billionaires <laughs> are a policy failure every billionaire is a policy failure debt in scripture so what is debt in scripture well the law the goal of jewish law is restoration and to have no interest loans jesus takes that further he's like yeah give more freely and broadly than that Debt in the U.S., what is that like? Well, private indebtedness is huge and it's growing. There are far fewer protections from poverty or bankruptcy. Like in 2008, the banks planned on repossessing our home. There are no institutional barriers to that. There still aren't. The wealth gap is larger than ever and it's growing. Just take the racial wealth gap between blacks and whites today. There is an increase of four times from 20,000 to 95,000. What take penal servitude in scripture. The goal of penal servitude is, in Jewish law, restorative, not retributive justice. People need to be given a chance to work off their debt and be re the community. That's a major priority. What is penal servitude in the US? Not these things. Uh, it is retributive and not restorative. So prisons, in, including private prisons, mean that prisoners are slaves. That's baked into the 13th Amendment and U.S. corporations use prison labor to assemble computers, women's lingerie, telemarketing for as little as 17 cents to 25 cents an hour. There's no benefits, overtime, union laws, sick days, or pensions. There is not much concern for reintegration. We're imprisoning more people than ever, uh, we're more so than China, India, and Iran combined. And we imprison more black men than South Africa did during apartheid as a percentage of black male population in the US. So uh, Michelle Alexander argues that imprisonment is a new form of Jim Crow. Some people see prisons and prison labor as a way to handle the inner city. If you look at Georgia's laws, 440, SB 440 and SB 441, and you can see that as examples. There's racial bias up and down the criminal justice system and the culture of prisons leads to recidivism. Then, and that's the legal stuff, right? That's, that's all legal currently in the US. Now, nominally what is illegal is labor trafficking and sex trafficking. And there's a lot of that around the globe. So what is needed is a third abolition People speak of this because the first abolition was the Christian abolition in like northern, Northwestern and Northern Europe. Like that was the first abolition. The second abolition was the British abolition. And then yes, after the civil war in the US, there was, that was part of the second abolition. And now we need a third abolition. So this is why we're concerned about things like fair trade laws. Uh, one major challenge is Islam. 
in uh, slavery in Islamic societies is not slowing down. So the Prophet Muhammad en endorsed slavery. Uh, he took slaves, traded slaves. He said female concubines are permitted. Basically, a man could marry up to four wives and have unlimited concubines. So that is what gave rise to a massive trade in female slaves, not male slaves so much, although that happened too, but more female slaves uh, in the Arab Islamic slave trade. And in Islamic history, there has been no abolitionist movement. Europeans took over the Islamic slave ports in Africa, and then abolition was initially forced onto Islamic countries by the British. So this is a huge deal if you are concerned about human trafficking globally. And it's also a huge deal that whether atheism or secularism can engage with Islam. Can atheism and secularism serve as a moral foundation? Well, probably not. John Gray says secular humanism is a Christian heresy. It's a hollowed out version of Christianity. Friedrich Nietzsche said, if you cut the root, you lose the fruit. In other words, yeah, sure, we wanna believe that the West, just because of the cultural West um, is abolitionist. Mm, that's more the legacy of Christianity and secularism or atheism probably has no power in Muslim countries. So when scripture expresses concern about slavery, what is it really concerned about? How do people fall into it? And are, are we equally concerned? There, there's also questions about, can Christians use force? If so, how? Laws by Constantine, Clovis II, and Batilde, and British evangelicals using the British Navy to deter slave trading raise really important but difficult questions for Christians. Can we do something similar to fight human trafficking? Should we? Uh, that, that goes beyond what my presentation's about, but those are definitely questions that are raised when we look at the history of slavery in, uh, in a church history perspective. So how to process US history? Well, US history is one expression of plantation capitalism. If you, it, it manifests heresies about land, labor, and people. Again, these are not, the things that were done in the colonies and in the US, you could not do them in Europe because the church stood against them. So when you compare the uh, uh, typical white American evangelical ethics with Catholic social teaching, and let's say Peter Moran and the Catholic worker, or compare with Eastern Orthodox ecological ethics like Patriarch Bartholomew or Pope Francis's um, encyclical. I, I mean, American evangelical Christian ethics are just anemic. They're thin because we have accommodated ourselves to theft. US history also includes many attempts to escape historic Christian ethics. So to, to see US history as church history, but very sad church history. I mean, we have to do that. This is, uh, I'm totally for uh, a justice policy platform, but not from a secular left perspective. This is Christian because we're, we keep trying to catch up with genuine Christian ethics. So the conflict between, and finally, the conflict between liberal and evangelical Protestantism in the US flows from American slavery and Protestant instability about how we define words. So if you want more information about this, uh, there's another class that I and the Anastasis Center teach. It's called The Long Repentance, and you can find it here. And if you want more info on slavery, especially, there's a whole webpage dedicated to that. There are three papers that of notes that I've taken on slavery and Christianity in the Bible, slavery and Christianity from the first to the 15th century, and slavery in Islam from the seventh to the 21st century that I think are, are really important. 